Hey guys, Adam Savage in my cave uh, with some model making that I did back in the day. Um, my specialty when I worked in commercial and film special effects was uh, I was what you'd call a hard edge model maker. I was good with the ships and the vehicles and the buildings. I am not a sculptural form maker, although I have done some of those to execute some of my projects. It was not my specialty. That, that definitely was a different kind of mindset. Um, but I built lots of spaceships over the years. And in 2000, I took a job for Gloob Toys to build a set of models for uh, one of their lines. And I built four models for them. I built a Star Destroyer, a TIE Interceptor, a Y-Wing Fighter, and a Snow Speeder. Uh, and I hired my friend Dave Fogler to build two of those. He executed the, the, the Star Destroyer and the Snow Speeder. I did the other two. And the Y-Wing is, this is maybe one of the finer models I built in my career. Uh, you can see the scale. This is one of the nacelles sat here. Um, I actually ended up getting to go to the Letterman Complex and having a meeting with Lucasfilm uh, merchandising about the accuracy of this model. Uh, and I actually opened up a Star Wars book in the meeting to show them which of the multiple Y-Wing fighters that I chose as my master because they're all radically different. Like the piping on them is, there is no symmetry past the actual overall topography between Y-Wing fighters. And I had to tell them that. This is a casting that I made back when I built this. This is again, 20, 23 years ago. Uh, and I made this casting with the plan that eventually I would make my own Y-Wing fighter. And this is a thing that has come up a few times since I have been, <laughs> since I made things like this. Because if there's one rule of model making, it's that you never get around to the one that you made for yourself. Every model maker has this. Like you, you just, it, they all end up being these projects sitting in parts. And clearly like this, I have not changed since I pulled it out of the mold. And this is actually, for the purposes of our discussion, a really great way to see how the mold making works. I took the main body of the Y-Wing fighter and set it up in a way to elicit as few bubbles as possible as the resin came in and filled the model up from the underside. And every molding of a form involves this kind of thinking. Like you, put, you set it up like this, so that when you pour it like this, air and gravity become your friend in obtaining a high fidelity casting. Um, and if you look at a close up here, you can see there's this little blue chunk over here. And this little blue chunk is actually a bit of silicon. And I'm gonna carefully crack this mold open just to take a look at it. So this is the mold I built 23 years ago. This is a, a, a standard uh, methodology that I used to make molds back then. Um, I just made a box out of foam core. I did the setup of the model here. Uh, you can see the, the two ports where the pouring gate is. And I think if I carefully pull this apart, you can see, yeah, there you go. That's great. Um, so there's an issue with this silicone. It looks pretty supple right now. But when I made this casting, again, 23 years ago, it pulled a little bit of silicon out of the mold and you can see it right there. That's what that blue chunk is. Silicon can be uh, brittle after many years. And these, this mold here, I can actually feel it. It's just the tiniest bit sticky. It might not survive another casting. As good as it looks and as well as I've stored it, this is a real issue I've had with old molds is that like, well, I'd love to run one more casting out of these, but I'm terrified of destroying the mold to do this. I, I have gotten gifts from friends in effects that were the last casting that ever happened out of that mold. Um, and that always feels like, that always feels like a loss, right? Well, uh, our friends at Lumafield, actually, they keep, we keep on coming up with new things to scan and see the insides of. And we wondered if, being able to scan these molds non-invasively and ending up with a 3D point cloud of what that topography is might not be a way to bring a restoration to these old pieces. So I have a, I have, I, we actually sent them one of, uh, one of the nacelle molds uh, and this Y-wing fighter body mold uh, and this, oh yeah, 
here is one in which I feel pretty sure it wouldn't survive another casting. Um, this mold isn't totally separated, but if you look really carefully inside, what you can see is that this actually molds the canopy on the top of the Y-Wing fighter, which is never more than about 20, 25 thousandths thick. That is like five sheets of paper thick. This is absolutely the kind of mold that I would be terrified to do a casting in, lest it end up completely crapping the bed. Um, so the good news is these were scanned by Lumafield and we actually have the product of these scans and we are gonna talk about them right now. I'm really excited. You wanna come on in, sir? All right. <laughs> Um, all right. Oh, well, you have pieces. For I you. didn't yeah, realize you'd right. have actual pieces. Yeah, so what we did was we scanned these in a CT scanner. Yep. And then we were able to see the contours of the cavity inside each of these molds. Yeah. Which we could then export, turn into an STL, and reverse to get the positive. So we got the, an STL of the negative, then we reverse it, we get the STL of the positive. I, then we can 3D print it. So I, I can show you what this looks like. If we take this mold here that you gave us, mm -hmm. um, with the, uh, with the engine, we put it in our scanner and we rotate Ooh. it inside the scanner and we get these x-ray images from different angles. I see a ghostly shape of ghostly. the cell there. Yeah, totally. You can already start to see what it is. Yeah. But you know, when you look at a single image like this, um, a darker area might be thicker or it might be denser, um, but it's only when you start to rotate it that you can understand the basic underlying form. Mm -hmm. So then the software takes these images and it turns it into a 3D model that you can Oh wow, that you can with explore. rubber bands and everything. Rubber bands, yeah, exactly. That is so so cool. See, <laughs> and you know, including the, the two sides of the, uh, the, the enclosing tube here were, yeah. were offset when we put it in the scanner, so that, that comes through as well. <laughs> now, what we can do that's really neat is we have data on the, uh, the, the relative densities of different areas here. So we can start to peel away the denser areas and see the shape inside. So. <laughs> Here it is. Dude. Now, am I correct in seeing that it looks like there's actually some variable density within the silicon itself? Yeah, it looks like that. Um, it could be, uh, it, it looks like it's the area around the edges here. Um, it looks like there's maybe some some hardened plastic inside yeah, the, the tube here. Yeah. yeah. Um, so maybe as, as different areas of the silicone have been exposed to different amounts of air, or, you know, other, other conditions maybe kept in, in, uh, in the light, uh, it's changed. Right Over here, time. this blows my mind. I mean, every model shop in the world has molds like this. Right, Really right. old molds that you're terrified to cast in because, um, so I'm curious about the fidelity. I haven't looked up close yeah. here. The, the, the internal details of these molds are, are a treasure. Right. And it's the invisible part of the mold exactly. that you want to reproduce. Exactly. So, so what we're even able to capture here, if you look very closely, you can even see the, the flash um, here around the, uh, the, oh, man, the yeah. front of the engine where um, this is where the, the two halves of the of the silicone come together and yeah, you know you yeah. see this in any kind of molding a little bit of plastic wants to escape between the two high, yeah. sides, yeah. sides of the mold and here you're you're seeing that as well what we can do from here we can actually we can crop in as well so we can we can see this um, oh are you slicing is yeah that... so we can like cut back and forth in oh wow cut in like this um, there too, you can you can see you know the channels that you provided yep, for the yep. original mold. Hand cut channels. Um, God, I and, was so a... mediocre at mold making when I did that. <laughs> but the result is incredible. I mean, this is a beautiful piece. So from here, what we would do then is is create a uh, uh, a mesh, and um, and then this this becomes an STL file that's you know anyone with a three D printer would be familiar with. But the trick is that this STL file includes not just the external details of the of the mold, but the right. internal details it's as well. Everything. So then we take this and we use um, modeling software to basically reverse this STL to create the positive. So we have a model of the negative. We can just say, take the air inside it, turn that into the model, and then, and then 3D print it. And, and this is what we get when we 3D print it. All right, now I'm looking at this for the first time. Dude! Wow. It's spectacular. Yeah, um, it really, I mean, it really shows your work here. It really is. It's kind of amazing. I have here the other nacelle. Oh, that's incredible. I mean, I see some softness here and there, mm -hmm. but I mean, even even it's almost got the ridges here, this mm -hmm. this very very subtle ridged part. I can't even remember how I achieved that ridging. I probably yeah. that's probably the the like cap of a toothpaste bottle or mouthwash right, right, or something right. like that to get the uh, 
the ridges. Is this a lost art, making uh, models this way by actually carving down some material and then doing uh, silicone molding around it? It is a, it's an esoteric art, and uh -huh. 3D printing has certainly made a lot of that obsolete, right? Sure. Like, you know, you can do so much in the computer to get a really viable product out of a 3D printer. Um, and there's, I still feel this real grace to doing that kind of work. And yeah. I mean, train enthusiasts, model makers, home model makers and amateurs totally still using this technology right, all right, the right. time. That's incredible. Okay, uh, were there challenges presented by, by each of these pieces? As I look at the, yeah. the, the body here, I see a lot of noise. Yeah, that's right. So I can show you what that scan looks like here. So here's the, here's the large mold you sent us. Um, <laughs> With the main body of the of the Y wing, you can yeah. see you know here are the rubber bands again. Um, here's uh, so here's that it's the all preserved with every last. Here's detail. this prism. You can start to see the the channels that yeah. you left, um, and then I'll I'll do the same thing. So we can start to peel away the the material using this histogram, and and here's the the inner shape of it. And if you compare this again, you 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 see this. Uh, Flashing up, yeah, up here yeah. around the front, which is in fact uh, present in in the original casting that yeah, ran here. This is this is the, that that scalloping you see. That's actually using a curved blade to cut the silicon, oh, so wow. it self it, it self registers back uh -huh, when you uh -huh. put it back together. It's a jeweler's cut. That's fascinating. I had no idea. Yeah, um, but this is a you know this is this was a little bit trickier to scan. You can see a bit of noise um, as you rotate around here, mm -hmm. and this has to do with with kind of how a CT scan works again you're you're taking these x-ray images um, and you're you're rotating the the part and you have to be able to look through all of this material um, as, as you go and as you go down the periodic table materials attenuate x-rays more so they start to look darker in these images okay um, and plastic generally scans very very well but silicone turns out to be quite dense and uh, silicone is full of silicon which right. is right next to aluminum on the periodic table. Ah. So silicone actually um, looks quite dark in these scans. So, so you, to the CT scanner, it's a little bit, it's, it's a little bit close to as difficult as scanning through solid aluminum. It is, it is, yeah. Which again is easier than scanning through steel and that's sure. easier than scanning through lead. But you know, as it goes, um, it's it's a bit trickier to scan than plastic. So we ran a, you know, a reasonably fast scan of this, which meant that we had to apply some gain to it. Right. And just as applying gain in a camera and exposing a photo would Lead to a little bit of noise. Yeah, that also yeah. led to a little bit of noise here. So you see that noise in the surface of the of the fighter here. I find that really satisfying. That yeah. that, that gain from photography, generally considered a two D art, is totally applicable and analogous to That's three right. dimensions. Yeah, it creates noise in the three dimensional model just as it does in uh, in a two dimensional photo. And presumably, actually, there are ways to potentially mitigate that or post process it with That's right. potentially yeah. machine learning and some you can other processes. Run a longer scan. Scan, you can add um, add. Oh you know, right, like a long exposure. That's right. Yeah. So you can either apply gain or run a longer exposure. And in this case, when you're taking, you know, fifteen hundred uh, exposures to make this to make this run, yeah, um, spending thirty seconds on on each exposure turns it into quite a long scan. But you can do it, and that means that you can draw the the gain down and get so, a cleaner scan. So for certain like mission critical things, if the Smithsonian brought you some priceless artifact to scan, that's right. You can scan it for days All night. Yeah. at a ridiculous exactly. resolution in exactly. order to remove that noise. Precisely. Oh, that is super cool. And so this one turned out a bit cleaner than the Y-wing body because this is less silicone. It's going like through the X-rays. Got go it. Yeah. Got it. Oh, that's amazing. It's still kind of mind-blowing <laughs> to see a 3D print from the negative space inside a silicon mold. And there it is. That, that, that was the, one of the harder parts to to execute, uh, I vacuum formed this and then carved out those windows and tried not to break through any of those little guys. Yeah, I was so impressed that you were able to do this. I mean, even just in removing this from the supports after 3D printing, I broke a couple of those. Yeah. Uh, that you can see. <laughs> so that sits right there and it fits uh -huh. perfectly right on my model. That's amazing. Um, and, and this, you said that this is a mold that you wouldn't be able to reuse, you think? This is a mold I would be terrified to cast in again uh -huh. because it, the, the silicon may feel supple, yeah. but it tears much more easily over time. It mm -hmm. doesn't rot quite like silicone, no, sorry, quite like latex does, mm -hmm. which could rot even with no exposure to UV. Uh, but still that like silicone flashes off 
And right, as right. it leaches that out, and, and also depends on how much the mold was abused. The, mm -hmm. the, the, the urethane has an exothermic reaction, which leaches silicone out. It also has, uh, it also naturally, if, if people used to store their molds by pouring and casting in and letting that casting sit in the mold uh -huh. as a stability thing, the problem is, is the urethane resin would leach silicone over time out of the mold. And then when you touch the surface, it gets really brittle. Uh -huh. So there's, it, it's, it's a high fidelity process, but it's volatile. Yeah, yeah. What was the process for actually bringing these to market after you made the prototypes? You have the silicone mold, you're able to run just a handful of shots out of it. Um, when you handed this over to the folks at Lucasfilm, or... Uh, well, so I handed it over to sorry. my friend Jim Fong at Galoob. Okay. He then sends these to China. Mm -hmm. They go into the factory, and the factory has a model making department that Jim was never allowed to see the inside of. This is like where all their dark arts happen. Uh -huh. And the prototypes that he would get out would actually look precisely like the model I sent, but as a completely take apartable with screw bosses and screws, uh -huh. like what the toy would be if it has like little guns that shoot, they would have built that functionality yeah, yeah. in. And I've seen these prototypes up close. They're kind of, I have a hard time conceiving of how these modelers are doing this. And Jim was like, oh man, I tried to get into that room so many <laughs> times. Uh, so that would be the process. They got would it, then make the masters uh -huh. that would then be used for their tooling makers to make tools for these. Got it, got it. Um, so there's several more steps before EDM cuts this into a piece of tool steel. And, indeed. Yeah. And I don't think the line that I built was ever produced in the size that I built that line in. Huh. Um, I think that I, I have one of their Newton Rune shuttles from uh, episode one, mm -hmm. and that is a prototype. It's beautiful. And it was like when Galoob went away, I'm, mm -hmm. some, somebody gave me this prototype. And you can see, again, this, the modeler's work is in. Yeah, yeah. Like I, it, to me, when I watch golf, I love watching golf because I just don't understand how it's remotely possible. Uh -huh. I felt the same way looking at these models from, <laughs> from the factory room. That's incredible. Yeah, the, the, the different levels of craft getting translated together is, is one of the most remarkable parts of looking at the finished product and, you know, looking at the prototype and thinking about how you got there. Well, it means like when I see a toy on the shelf that has a high fidelity to the original, I'm really impressed because yeah. I know how many steps it went <laughs> through and how many places there are for uh, for irregularities to be introduced or uh, economies to lead to less, less detail on mm -hmm. things. Um, but I have boxes for little of these old molds and I think you might be able to help me out. <laughs> yeah, we'd love to run more of these. I can show you the canopy if you'd like. Oh yeah, please show me the canopy. That, that part just blows me away. All right, so, so here it is again, um, you know, yeah, looking yeah. at the, uh, the outside of it, surrounded with foam core and I love the idea bands. that you could print an object that looks exactly like this piece of crap. Yeah, we can even <laughs> capture capture the torn edges on yeah, the foam core. Yeah, I see that. Right, and so when when we kind of did this this object, this one was was puzzling to us. It's not. It wasn't immediately clear, right. uh, you know, what this was going to turn into. But but so you so can fine. see how what I'm doing here is I'm using the natural water, the natural uh, hydraulic pressure of mm -hmm. pouring into this wide gate to bring the resin up through and actually using that process is really key for silicone molding. Right, right. Yeah, just the amount of uh, the amount of craft that went into this is incredible. And you can actually see, are these more of the jewelers? Uh, yeah, those are the jewelers pieces? scallop cuts. I can actually show them to you here. I think we can, we can see them up close. You use a curved blade and as you go, the nice thing about a curved blade is it if you're doing this correctly, you're not actually creating lots of little skinny parts, little mm -hmm. skins that like stick out. It, it's, it, it is it uh, a variegated topography, but n with no undercuts. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And so then when you dust this and you bring it back together, the silicone parts just align like fingers, like yeah, really yeah. nice. This is... Um, oh man, that looks so cool. It's it almost it's ethereal. It's kind of like floating in this bath of, yeah, uh, of totally. silicone, waiting to be rediscovered. It is a it is a fun process to think the uh, to do the upside down and backwards thinking of mold yeah. making. And yeah. I love that we're sort of reversing it to do this. Yeah, that's right. Two more reversals happen right, right here. Exactly, so. and then you finally get the object. Yeah, back. yeah, exactly. You see this type of thinking everywhere, uh, especially where three D printing is becoming a key part of some process. Okay. So. 
a lot of investment casting now is done with 3D printing. I've seen a lot of that. Yeah, so you take a 3D printed positive of your of your object, um, it's called a pattern, you know, and you immerse it in a liquid ceramic slurry, you harden it, you burn out the pattern. Now you have a void in the ceramic, yeah. in the shape of the pattern, pour metal in, break away the ceramic. Literally the oldest making process. That's right, there's a lot of wax casting. Yeah. And now you can do it by starting with a 3D printed part. Um, same thing with a lot of uh, dental 3D printing work. This is like the biggest field of applications for 3D printing. I hadn't that thought there of is. that. I get you right. Yeah. So you think of those clear aligners, yeah. um, where uh, where they send you a new aligner every week. Um, that starts by often biting into an impression tray, mm -hmm. scanning the impression tray, uh, and then you have the positive model of your teeth again. Then they manipulate your teeth. They create a different model of your teeth right, for right. every week of the treatment, and then they vacuum form plastic onto a 3D print of your teeth. So the, the thing that you're receiving is not itself 3D printed, but it's made over a 3D printed wow. pattern. So the, this shows up all over the place. 3D printing is really integrated in a lot, in a lot of different processes. Yeah. You're not actually holding a 3D printed part in your hand, but you're holding something that 3D printing was integral to fabricating. Right. And let's be really clear, because I'm not sure people might understand, but like when you're scanning teeth, and then they're coming up with a model of where they want your teeth to go. They are adjusting those teeth, but they're also adjusting them to what you can take, right? They don't right. want it to hurt. Yeah. And this is this these are you know, thousands of an inch they're adjusting in order so that they're not hurting you, but they are moving your teeth and that you're able to maintain that level of fidelity is amazing. That's right. Yeah, exactly. So this way of thinking is is really everywhere even in the purely digital world. That's really cool. That analogy between the, the photo process and the 3D process with the gain and the noise really kind of blows my mind because it, it speaks to your device being it, being sort of like one of the early photographic cameras. Yeah, that's right, that's right. Right, like it's only gonna get better from here Yeah, about being able to see the insides of things. That's right, that's right. Yeah, the algorithms can do, I mean, as the software improves, the outcome improves and um, you know, the hardware can improve constantly as well. I, 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 you know, we, we took apart a Star Wars uh, ship model recently, and the, the hardest part was just figuring out what the internal topography was, where you put the spudger to undo the little glass. Right, class. right. Because they never built it to be dismantled. <laughs> and you got to go inside, and I, I could picture the, oh, wow, yeah, the iFixit guys. Yeah, exactly. Would probably love your technology for figuring out how to take apart some of these technologies that they yeah. do breakdowns on. You can find these secret affordances that the manufacturers build in, a little, a little clasp somewhere, um, you know, a little... Uh, little lever that you can that you can drive in on. Oh, that's so cool. So uh, behind me, there's some architectural models and I build these of spaces that I live in and spaces uh -huh. that I'm interfacing with. And one of the hidden aspects of building your own architectural model of a space you know is that it's often a great way to find where the HVAC is routed. Because <laughs> when you divvy up all the rooms, there's often blank spaces where they're running it between yeah, floors. Yeah, yeah. And I've, yeah. I've found HVAC routing in one of my old houses that way. Yeah, yeah. That's this like something out of an Agatha Christie novel where you realize that there's like two <laughs> much space between two closets and something must be back there. Oh, right. This could be, this is actually, yeah, This in 20 years, this could be an important security thing of like, you can't hide anything in your lighter. Yeah, that's right. That's right. <laughs> well, yeah, already you can figure out what's in a lighter. So that's, uh, oh, that's with us now. Airport security actually does sometimes use CT to scan bags. That's the, the newest generation of TSA checkpoint equipment is actually really? a CT scanner. Yeah. Amazing. They run a very fast CT. It's tuned for the types of things that they're looking for in luggage, and it's lower resolution than these, but uh, but it is giving them a 3D model of your suitcase that they're looking at in real time. Crazy. I This technology continues to throw me with its possibilities. <laughs> Thank you so much for doing this, and this blows my mind. I wanna actually end up building this because I just love the idea that it was scanned from the void. Of course, thank you for letting us look inside this piece of history. This oh, is man. fantastic. I'm gonna find some other stuff for you to play with. Please do. Special thanks to Lumafield for this video for giving me a glimpse back into my model making past. It was lovely to unpack those molds and to not just see them again, but also see them in an entirely new way. If you would like to fly through the scans that you saw in the video and some other scans that we've recorded before this, as always, there's a link in the description. Thank you guys for watching. I'll see you next time.